Hi, this is Pastor Tim Bagwell. I'm so glad that you're watching. I've got such an incredible word to share with you today. I believe it's going to impact your mind, your spirit, your body, your finances, because there's something about the word. The word will make you free. I know that God cares about you and he cares about your family. He wants to touch your loved ones that are lost. He wants to heal the family member that's sick. He wants to help you be the person that God has called you and ordained you to be. I know that what you're getting ready to hear is going to liberate you, encourage you, and give you strength to face the battles that you're about to face in the future. Well, remember this, we care about you, we're praying for you, for your family, and most of all, remember, you are who God says you are. Praise God. Let's turn to the 23rd Psalm. The 23rd Psalm. Psalm 23. And I know you don't believe I can get anything done in the time I have left, but I can. Psalm 23. I'm going to read the whole 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anoints my head with oil, my cup runneth over. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, anoint every ear to hear, every mind to perceive, and every heart to believe in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. You may be seated. I want to preach to you today about five, five divine characteristics of a godly man and father. I want to give you five key things the Bible teaches us to examine ourselves, And I want to give you five key things that I want you to look at yourself and say, man, this is really functioning in my life. It's really flowing. It's really happening. Because if it is functioning and happening, you're going to see multi-generational blessing in your bloodline. First of all, let's define the word father, the title father. We all have our preconceived notions of what the word father means, but in a true biblical or spiritual sense, uh, and, I, and I pulled definitions from uh, Webster's, I pulled definitions from Vines, I pulled definitions from different sources, but I want to give you the common things that really define who a father is. Number one, a father is a creator. If you're a father, you are a creator. You are an originator. There are things about who you are that originates or begins things within your family. You're an author. And all of this has to do with the creative elements and the creative responsibilities of fatherhood. You're also, by definition, a protector and a nourisher. By definition, you're also a protector and a nourisher. So if we can condense it a little bit, you're a creator, you're a protector, and you're a nourisher. And those are the things that I'm going to emphasize today is the creative the protective, and the nourishing. In America today, the first thing that I want to say to you is the first divine characteristic that you as a father need to make sure is in operation, whether you're a father, a grandfather, or a great-grandfather, is that you are present. The, the Bible tells us in Psalm 23, 4, he says, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Hebrews 13, 5 says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Matthew 28, 20 says, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. 
And one of the redemptive names of God is Jehovah Shammah, which in essence means Jehovah or the Lord is there or the Lord is present. How many are glad God doesn't leave you nor forsake you? Well, here's the stats again in America. One third of children 18 years of age and under the United States of America are living fatherless. That number is 17.2 million children in America are living fatherless that are minors. This does not include all the millions of young men and young ladies that have passed the age of 18 that have never had the true influence of a godly man or a father in their life. Years and years ago they did, I think it was at San Quentin Penitentiary in California, they, uh, they did a thing for inmates to give Mother's Day cards to their mothers and supply them with them. So they ordered a certain amount and within a few moments they were gone. There wasn't any left. And so when Father's Day came around they even ordered more cards to where the men could send Father's Day cards. To their awakening, virtually none of the cards were given out because those that are in penitentiaries today, there is a huge number in the 80 to 90% that they have had no true paternal influence. Some of the comments were, why, why would I send him a card? All he ever did was cuss me out. All he ever did was abuse me. All, he abandoned our family, he forsook us. I never knew who he was. And these are the inmates in penitentiaries, but yet these same men were sending love expressions to their mothers. Gentlemen, if we're going to be men of God, we got to be present. God is always present. If we say, I want to be like Jesus or I want to be like the Lord, it is requiring us to be present. It's requiring us to be there when our kids need us to be there. It's requiring us to sacrifice different things that they just don't tell us about their activities, tell us about their events, tell us about their band concert, their sporting events, but we actually are there and we're actually supportive and we're actually present. Can you imagine this? One third of American children I'm not talking about third world countries. I'm talking about the greatest nation on the planet. One third of our minors live without the consistent influence of a father. If we could have one breakthrough in America today, that would be that dads actually show up. That dads are there. That dads are a voice of reason. They're a voice of wisdom. Maybe a voice of discipline. Maybe a counterbalance that is needed in the home. God did not just join men and women together for procreative purposes. He joined them together because we each have unique uh, dynamics and qualities that we bring to the table that helps to bring balance into our sons and daughters. We need the tenderness of every mother. And we also need the toughness of every father. We need the emotional expressions of every mother. But we also need the logic of every father. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God put men and women together in holy wedlock that the next generation would benefit from it because of the divine attribute that God is always present. When we, when we think about things in fathering, we have to think, all right, God is present and God is a protector. He's Jehovah Nissi, which means he's a banner. He's a, a basically a rod of authority. Uh, the word banner to us means one thing, but in the ancient days, it could have been something as simple as a pole or a rod, but it was something that was lifted in the air and it denoted uh, a rallying of the armies, a rallying of the troops because it, it represented the, you might say the warlike or the defensive nature of God, how God would take care of his people. When the word, uh, the title Jehovah Nissi came forth in scripture, it came forth after 
the battle with the Amalekites. And you recall Moses went to the mountaintop. They set him down on a rock and they held up his hands and he held the rod of God in his hands. And as long as the rod of God was extended, the battle went for the nation of Israel. Here's a nation that had never been taught how to battle. They'd never been taught how to war and they were ambushed from behind. And these inexperienced men were fighting against a well-trained army. But Moses went to the mountaintop and he held the rod of God in his hand. And the battle went for Israel. Because God is a protector of his people. And as dads, as fathers, there should be a protective authority that is within us for our sons and our daughters and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. We should never stop being protectors. You could say amen. amen. Ephesians 5, 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. It's not a very popular scripture to read nowadays. Even as Christ is the head of the church. But when you research that term head, it means protector, and covering. It just doesn't simply mean, okay, he's the boss. In essence, it's really saying he is the covering or the protector of the wife, as Christ is the protector of the church. And guys, I'm, I'm going to get into this real good here. Uh, Psalm 23, 4 says, I rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So the weapons of the shepherd comfort the sheep because they know they are protected. If you're the head of anything, that means, as Harry Truman said, the buck stops here. And I've always had that, that statement on my desk, the buck stops here. Because if you're the head of anything, whether it's you're the head of a church, the head of a family, the head of a business, when the wind really begins to blow and the storms really begin to arise, you're the one that gets the blunt of the storm. Real men, guys, dial in. Real men are not whiners. And all the ladies are clapping. Real men are not whiners. And gentlemen, quit trying to make your wife your mama. So I thought this was Father's Day and everything you were going to say is good. It is all good, but you need to hear this. We got too many men that come home at the end of the day and all they do is whine and complain to their wife and tell them how tired they are, tell them how stressed they are, tell them how overwhelmed they are. And they, it's like you have tried to transfer your mama's role to your wife. Your wife's not there to help your boo-boo. Your wife is not there to pat you on the head and tell you you're a little sweetheart and everything is going to be okay. It's all right to be an encouragement to your husband, but husbands, you need to man up. You need to be able to understand something, that there are pressures that you have to deal with that your wife was not designed by God to carry. She's not wired that way. She wasn't created to bear up under that kind of stress or pressure. Says, oh, I, I want her to know and understand everything. I think there's a wise way to bring revelation to all things, but I don't think putting your wife into a nervous breakdown or a physical collapse or a migraine headache or keeping her awake at night because she's not sure whether you guys are going to survive from one day to the next. I believe that men that are protectors have to learn how to face the winds of adversity and not be crybabies about it. I believe we've got to be able to rise up and we've got to be able to say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You should be a calming force to your family and not a trouble-stirring emotional mess. God didn't call you to be an emotional outburst. He called you to turn to God and carry it to the Lord. If you know him, then you know you can cast your cares upon God because he cares for you. The immensity of pressure that men should bear should be heavier than their spouses or their children ever have to bear. 
And if you wonder sometimes why your husband gets grouchy, maybe he's bearing up under some things that he has not chosen yet to share because of the pressure that he's under. You say, oh, you're you're preaching the wrong thing. No, I am telling you something. God wired men different than he wired women. Women are creative. Women are brilliant. Women are incredible. But there are some things God requires a man to put on his shoulders and bear and be the man of God, be the husband, be the father, be the head, be the protector. Now that went over. Go with me over into the book of Samuel. I want to talk about protection for just a minute. See Psalm, uh, just one second, Psalm 46, one. God is our refuge and our strength and our very present help in trouble. So we see two things here. God is present, but God is our refuge and our strength. He is our protection. Then it goes on in 1 Samuel 23, eight verses, uh, verses 8 through 12. 1 Samuel chapter 23, 8 through 12. And Saul, I don't think that's it. Trice, don't worry about it. I must have put 1 Samuel. I think it's 2 Samuel maybe. Try it and see if you can find it. It's about David's mighty men. There were three key men in David's crew that were listed as these mighty men. One was a Dino. That's right. And these be the names of the mighty men who David had. The Tachmanite that sat in the seat of the chief among the captains. The same was a Dino, the Esnite. He lifted up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. That's one bad dude. This is one battle, one spear, 800 down, and he's still standing. And what I, guys, we got to glean something from this. Not that you need to go out and get a spear and kill 800 people, uh, and I hope you don't do that, but we've got to learn that even when the odds are overwhelming against us, we, when we've done all we can do to stand, we stand and we war against the works of the enemy. We fight the powers of hell. And when everything goes against us, we don't throw up our hands and quit. We keep on warring. We keep on fighting. We keep on battling. Are you with me? Then it goes on. Next verse. And after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Yehohite. Man, that's worse than being a boy named Sue. Thank God he didn't name him Dodo the second. Dodo the Yehohite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines that were there, gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away. The next verse. He arose and he smote the Philistine until his hand was weary and his hand clave under the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day and the people returned after him to the spoil. He fought virtually single-handed. But I want you to catch something here. He fought so intensely and so hard and he had his hand wrapped around his sword. And one commentator brings it out this way, that his hand went into literally spasms around the sword and they had to pry his fingers fingers loose from his sword. You know something, guys? The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. The prophetic promise over your family is sharper than any two-edged sword. And the devil shouldn't be able to knock your weapon loose. People ought to have to pry the sword out of your hand. If you're coming at my family, I will not drop my prophetic promise. If you're coming after my family, I will not relinquish the revelated truth of the word of God. This man fought until the enemy was defeated and he couldn't even release his sword because he had held it so tight and so long. How much tighter should we hold on to the word of God as the enemy is coming against us like a flood? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world and no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Let's go to the last one. And after him was Shabbat the son of A.G. the Herorite. And the Philistines were gathered together in a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. How many know what lentils are? Beans. And the, Philist- and the people fled from the Philistines. So here's Shaman. Everybody abandons him. Next verse. 
But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines and the Lord wrought a great victory. Now I preached this before, but I'll tell you if the devil can get your bean field, he can get into your treasure house. And a lot of times we relinquish territory because it's easier to relinquish it than it is to stand up and fight even for the small things. And he said, this is God's bean field. And if you heathen Philistines think you're going to eat one bean out of God's bean field, I got news for you. You're going to have to kill me first. And he stood there and fought Philistines to keep them from capturing a bean field. Well, you know what? Your kids are worth more than a bean field. Your grandkids are worth more than a bean field. Your family's worth more than a bean field. And the nature of God is the nature of a protector. And when the enemy comes at your family, you've got to rise up in faith and say, whether it seems little or great, I will not let the enemy get one step into my turf. A lot of times we let our kids begin to go in directions and go into ways. Eh, it's not so bad. I mean, there's a lot of them doing a lot worse things. But the truth of the matter is we let them begin to step through doorways that they should not be in. And sometimes you got to take the unpopular position of saying, devil, you're not getting the bean field. Because if you get the bean field, then you're going to get something that's more valuable. Then something that's more valuable. And then something that's more valuable. This man said, the bean field doesn't belong to the Philistines. This bean field belongs to God. Your kids don't belong to the spirit of this world. Your kids and grandkids belong to God. But who's going to fight for them but you? No. Don't, don't sit around and think that, well, they have prayer meetings at the church and they'll take care of it. No. Who's really going to fight for your family but you? You've got to fight for them. You've got to walk the floor. You've got to believe God to set them free and to deliver them. Thirdly, the divine characteristic of God that should manifest itself in godly men is you are a provider. You're a provider. Jehovah Rohi and Jehovah Jireh are two names of God. Jehovah Rohi is the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So if the Lord's your shepherd and you shall not want, how many believe he's providing? He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. He anoints my own. He supplies my needs. Jehovah Jireh is God. The name means God will provide. And if you're going to be a provider in your family, that means you add to your family. Now back to this whiny thing. When, when men get so needy and whiny, what you're doing, you're making withdrawals all the time. And you will finally overdraw the account. Men should be adding to the home. Adding financially, adding spiritually, adding in wisdom. And uh, my dad, my dad didn't learn how to be a godly father because he had a great godly father. My dad's mother died when he was five, his dad when he was 16. And my dad has only shared one story with me about his father. And that was that he gave him a bank. He said he, he paid me 10 cents a week to work in the fields, and then he gave me a bank. And that's the only thing my dad ever said about his dad. He never talked to me about that he was godly. He never talked to me that he was a good man. He never talked to me that he was a hard worker. I know nothing about my grandpa Bagwell except he gave my dad a bank. And I think my dad had issues with it. And what I'm saying with this, my dad was an incredible father. But he didn't learn about fathering from his father. He learned about fathering from Abba Father. And my dad was a provider. But my dad added something constantly to our family. 
It was not just my mother that prayed over me. It was my father. It was not just my mother that talked to me about Jesus in the Bible. It was my father. It was not just my mother that prayed over me before I went to school. It was my dad who laid his hands on me virtually every day of my school years. What am I adding? He added something to the family. I never recall a day, even in the worst of times, when my dad did not bring financial addition to our family. He was not looking for me to bring financial addition to the family. He was not looking to my mother to bring financial addition to the family. He looked at himself as the provider of the house. He looked at himself as the one that was putting food on the table. Are, are you catching the drill? And God is a provider. He is the shepherd that causes us not to want. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is our prevision that brings provision. And as men of God, we should endeavor to be spiritual providers providers, providers of wisdom, and providers of resource. We're in two economy. We're in a different era in our nation today. And we're in a nation that uh, husbands and wives work. We're in a nation that our budgets get created by how much the woman makes, the lady makes, and how much the man makes. That merges together. It qualifies you for mortgages, et cetera, et cetera. What you buy, what you get is based in most counts now on two incomes. Say, are you preaching against that? No. But I will say to every man under the sound of my voice, it is your responsibility to be an adder to your house. You should not be just making withdrawals. You should not be making spiritual withdrawals emotional withdrawals, financial withdrawals, that everything is being placed upon your spouse to bring the addition to the house. If you're both working, God love you. But both of you need to be making spiritual additions. Both of you need to be making wisdom additions. Your children should not just be learning wise principles through mom. They should be learning wise principles through mom and dad. It's getting quieter here as I go on. Matthew 7, 11, how much more? If we being evil know how to give good gifts, how much more will the Father give good gifts? When we stop and think about this, God knows how to give good things because God is a provider. If we know how to give good gifts, how much better does he know and the more in tune we get with him, we will know what our families need the most at different times. Sometimes it's not that your family needs more money. Sometimes your family needs more prayer. Sometimes your family needs more wisdom. Sometimes your family needs you more present. You still here? I'm just going to read this to you because it is scripture. 1 Timothy 5.8. 1 Timothy 5.8. If any provide not for his own, and especially for those in his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. I didn't write this, but it's one of those scriptures that we don't read anymore. God has given every man a responsibility to be an adder to his house, to bring increase and to bring addition into his house. And the Bible says, if you're a believer, then you're going to take care of your family. If you're a believer, you will take care of maybe your family even a little bit bigger than just your wife and your kids. If you're able, you will help others in your family. But the bottom line comes down to it. It said, if you don't do this, I didn't write this. The Holy Ghost did. I didn't write this. It said, if you don't do this, you have denied the faith and you're worse than an unbeliever. Say, man, those are harsh words. I didn't write them. I'm just reading them. But one thing we got to understand about something. It's one thing, gentlemen, I'm going to be, just be blunt about it. It's one thing to be in between jobs, striving with everything in your ability to gain gainful employment. And it's another thing to just sit back in your lazy boy recliner and switch channels all day while your wife is out there working herself trying to provide for the home. There are times when physical illness, handicaps, different things occur, injuries, situations arise. But the desire of a true man of God is to be a provider and an adder to the economy, spiritually, emotionally, financially, in every way to his family. 
I don't expect any amens on this because this is a scripture that nobody's read in 20 years. But the truth of the matter is, if we want to have a nature of God, we have to accept the fact, gentlemen, that God has called us to be present, he's called us to be protectors, and he's called us to be providers. Last two things. He's called us to be priests. Jehovah Makedesh means the Lord who sanctifies. Jehovah Tzidkenu means the Lord our righteousness. And we have to understand that a priest restores and preserves spiritual order and holiness. He is restoring spiritual order and holiness within his home. And I don't know why it is that women seem to have a more intuitive nature about the spiritual context of their home and men release that over to them instead of rising up and say, I have a priestly responsibility to have order and holiness in my home. This is going to go down as the lowest all-time amen sermon I've ever preached. I mean, usually I have some, at least some people really hard of hearing that amen anything, but I, and they're all dialed in today. No. Hmm. We have a responsibility as a high priest of our home to restore and to preserve holiness, to restore and preserve order in our homes. It is our manly responsibilities as the high priests of our home, as the protectors of our home, to establish those things. He is the Lord our righteousness. That means he is the Lord of spiritual order. He is the Lord who sanctifies, which means he is the Lord who washes and cleanses us from sin, wrath, rebellion, disobedience, and preserves holiness in our lives. As men of God, we should have the spirit of righteousness upon us and the spirit that strives for holiness upon us. Well, I got the 12 disciples are with me now. But I I want you to hear this from me today. God's nature is to establish order and God's nature is to establish holiness. And if we're men of God and if we're priests of the Lord, then those things are happening. Now, how does this happen? We have to be men of prayer. Men don't pray like women. Yeah, they sure don't pray as much, bless God. You tell him, pastor. No, men pray different than women. Now, if I come home and Gayla's in a prayer role, uh, man, there's music playing. Lord, I'll walk in the house and the dog's heads are bowed. <laughs> man, I tell you, the Binions or a Darling Check or whoever it might be is on the Bose player upstairs. And when I hear the music going that loud, I figure, all right, something's going on. So I kind of slip into the bedroom and Gayla may be kneeling down in a chair. I mean, she's praying and heaven's coming down and the glory of God's exploding and uh, angels are appearing, lightning's flashing, thunder's rolling, pillar of fire, cloud of smoke, supernatural things are going on. She's praying. Men don't pray like that. What do you mean? God wired women different than men. Man, when I'm getting hit head all by something, I'm saying, God, I got to have a miracle. Now, when I'm, when I'm down here praying, walking the floors of the church, uh, I'm, just, I'm just going for it, but it's different. Now, God, this is who your word says you are. And Lord, you are Jehovah Jireh. And I declare you give me this day my daily bread. And I declare the kingdom be upon me. Now, it's not quite as dramatic. But it's not less sincere. So women, don't try to make your men pray like you pray. Just make sure they're praying. See, the the apostle Paul said we are to pray without ceasing. And, and I can say there are some days that I don't get a full hour of prayer in, but there's not a day that there's not an hour that goes by that I don't pray. Did you hear me? Now, sometimes I can't get a full hour in, and I know that, that just decimates some of you that love to spend three hours in your prayer closet, and that's great. He's anointed you to be a prayer warrior. 
But some days I don't get a full hour in, but there's not an hour goes by that I don't pray. I'll wake up in the middle of the night praying about stuff. And I may not burst forth in tongues, and I may not shake, and I may not have a hot flash and a cold chill, but I may wake up in the middle of the night and say, God, in the name of Jesus, help Aaron. Maybe I'm burdened about, and I, and I see the stress or the pressure he's under or the load that he's carrying. I, say, I may just wake up at 3 in the morning, and his face will be before I say, God, in the name of Jesus, I send the word to Aaron, help him. God, in the name of Jesus, we got a huge financial responsibility in the ministry. I declare you open the windows of heaven, roll back over and go to sleep. But there's hardly an hour that goes by that I don't pray. And that's what the apostles talk about, pray without ceasing. There's not a discontinuance of my prayer life, but sometimes I don't get an hour. Sometimes I don't get two hours. But I still cast my care upon the Lord because he cares for me. And gentlemen, if your house is going to be restored in righteousness, if your house is going to be preserved in righteousness, it's going to be restored in holiness, preserved in holiness, you're going to have to be a man of prayer. You're going to have to have a little more intimate relationship with the Lord than you know the latest stats about who's playing linebacker for the Broncos. You've got to have a little more knowledge about the things of the Spirit than you do about the things of the natural. You've got to have a little more Holy Ghost in you than you do political information. You've got to have a little more Holy Ghost working in you than you know what interest rates are. It's not good, not bad that you know that, but somewhere in Him you live, in Him you move, and in Him you have your being because every man of God should be a priest. Every man of God should reflect the Lord, our righteousness of the Lord our sanctification. Last point. Every man should be a prophet to his family. Say, well, what do you mean by that? God is Elohim. And the nature of Elohim is creative, governing, and sovereign. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. How did he create them? by speaking them into existence. And I want you to hear me, gentlemen. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And I think we too quickly ignore what God is revealing to us about our children, about our grandchildren. We keep our mouths shut because I guess we want to be, put them in a, a maze like a white mouse and hope they find the block of cheese at the end of it. Instead of maybe acknowledging what God's shown you about your son and your daughter, acknowledging their gifts, acknowledging their talents, and giving them maybe a little more to think about than just figure it out. I want to read something to you out of Genesis 35, 18. And it came to pass as her soul was departing. This is Rachel, Jacob's wife. For she died, that she called his name Benoi. But his father called him Benjamin. Real simple scripture. Mama named him Benoi, Benoi, something like that. Benoi. His father called him Benjamin. Names were prophetic in that generation. Benoi, Benoi meant son of my sorrow. The labor was so horrible, the bearing of this child was so intense that it took her life. And she named him son of my sorrow. But dad stepped in the room. Prophet dad said his name shall be Benjamin, which means son of the right hand, son of strength. Sometimes circumstances start speaking into the future generations and Jacob even though he was grieving because if you know the story how much he loved Rachel how much he cared for her and all the things about his relationship with Rachel he obviously was devastated at her death but when they said your son's name is son of sorrow he said no it's not it's the son of my right hand it's the son of my strength what was he doing? He stepped out of the role of a grieving spouse into the role of a prophetic father. You have to be able to look at your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, and hear from God 
and speak into their lives, not just opinions and advice, but hear from God, which requires you to be a man of prayer and say, listen, I see this gift in you. I see this talent in you. You're brilliant in this. You're powerful in this. This is your wheelhouse. This is your power zone, whatever term you want to put to it. But begin to cause that child to know this is not just about who they are in the flesh or the emotional, but it's also about who they are in the spiritual. And gentlemen, you may not be a prophet anywhere else, but you should be a prophet in your own home. You should be able to see the future over your sons and your daughters. You should be able to see the future over your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. You say, I don't ever see or understand anything, and that's why you need to go as the priest and be a man of prayer. Because God will show you things. There are things that Adam and Aaron are walking in today that God revealed them, revealed things to their mother and revealed things to me. And at the right and appropriate times, we begin to speak those things. My parents used to speak things into my life. And they tell me the story. And as I'm closing today, they tell me the story. Your mother should have never been able to conceive, but she did conceive. And God spoke to us during the pregnancy that you'd be a male child and be a prophet to my people. They'll say, well, they pushed you into ministry. No, they didn't. They told me those things, and I heard them. But there was something that was rising up inside of me that I knew that this is what I had to do. And it's what I wanted to do. But they gave me... They gave me a map. They gave me a GPS. They gave me something that, man, this may be what God has for my future. And I remember years later, I was about 16 or 17 years old, and I was kind of wrestling because then I went through the thing. Is this whole thing about being in ministry? Is this whole thing about being a prophetic voice? Is this whole thing about traveling all over the nation and the world? Is this just something mom and dad want to see happen? And I walked into a, a, a revival meeting and uh, had heard about this evangelist and my dad knew him, but my dad was out of town and said, hey, I heard that uh, Reverend so-and-so's in town. You need to go hear him preach. And so I went down by myself to this meeting and he's praying for everybody. And hundreds and hundreds of people there. And I got in the line, stood there, and waited and waited. And he never said one thing to anybody. He just kept putting his hands on them. God, in the name of Jesus, heal them if they're sick. God, in the name of Jesus, bless them. Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, touch their life. God, in the name of Jesus, minister to them. God, in the name of Jesus, release the touch of God on their life. And it was just, he was older, he was sitting in a chair, just, just was touching them as they went by. And I was toward the end of the line. There's maybe 10 people left of the line. And I came through that line, and he stopped. Had no idea who I was. And I was 16 or 17, he looked at me. He said, son, your mama didn't call you, and your papa didn't call you. The Lord called you. Go and be a prophet to his people. But the vector, the vector had already been established. The vector had already been established. My dad clave to the sword of the prophetic. He was there. He was there. The high times, the low times. Remember, I was really struggling. I was real young in ministry, and I was really struggling. I said, Dad, I don't know what to do. I'm confused. He said, I'll see you in a few hours. He climbed on an airplane, flew all the way to Miami, Florida. He said, let's talk. And he spent that whole week with me. He was there. He was there. He protected me. Sometimes literally and then sometimes with wisdom. He provided. I almost had to be careful to say I'd like this or I'd like that because he'd make a way to somehow make it happen. But he knew how to pray. He never prayed a prayer over a meal that he didn't ask God to bless me. He never let me walk out the door that didn't lay hands on me. And he never let me forget that I was born on this earth to make a difference in the kingdom. His daddy didn't teach him that. The father taught him that. His natural father didn't teach him that. He got an impartation of the Lord, 
Jehovah Shammah, Elohim, the Lord our righteousness, the Lord our sanctification, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our shepherd, Jehovah Nissi, the Lord our banner. He received that. And gentlemen, if you never had that in a dad, you can be that. If you never had that in a grandfather, you can be that as a grandfather. I never knew my grandparents. They were all gone by the time I was five. But if you're a grandfather, you can be a prophet, a priest, a protector, a provider. It's the will of God that you leave an inheritance for your children's children and be present and be present. He's a good, good father. Did you hear me? He's a good, good father. Stand to your feet across the house.